and buy a grant from Kellogg's, who reminds you to take time each day for reading. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. to grow a reading rainbow I can be anything take a look it's in a book a reading rainbow It's not news that Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers or that Susie sells seashells by the seashore. But today on Rating Rainbow, we're going to take a look at some other tongue twisters. Can you say rubber... B -b 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 Cut. Sorry, LeVar. I'm sorry. It's Reading Rainbow. Reading not, Rainbow. You said Rating Rainbow. I said Rating Rainbow. <laughs> Just take it easy. I'm Try. sorry. A little slower and I think you'll have it. Okay? Right. Here we go. Okay. Okay, let's have a quiet on the set. One more time. Reading Rainbow. And roll tape. Reading Rainbow. Reading Rainbow. Stand by. Okay. And slate, please. Scene one, take 45. Ready? Nice big smile. Yeah. Action. It's no secret that Peter Pepper picked a pike of pickled peppers. Cut. Right? Sorry, LeVar. What? Peter Piper. Peter Piper. Picked. Picked a... And reading rainbow. Okay, Peter Piper. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> Just take it a little slower. Okay. Nice energy. I think right. we'll have it. Here we go. Okay. And roll right. tape. Quiet on the set, everybody. Quiet on the set. Okay, stand by. Slate. Scene one. Take 46. Here we go. And action. It's no secret that Peter Pepper picked a pike... Uh, I'm sorry. What's that line? Cut. Scene one, take 48. Today I'm reading Rainbow. Cut. What? Sorry, we had an audio problem. <laughs> Scene one, take 49. Can you say rubber baby buggy bumpers five times fast? Cut. What? Can you put a little more life into it? Scene one, take 52. You've heard that Pepper Peter Pike's Cut. a poke at. <laughs> Scene one, take 59. 59. Today on Reading Rainbow, we're going to show you some other twink toasters. Can you say... Uh, what? I'm sorry. Listen, maybe... Maybe I ought to find another line of work, Larry. No, no, maybe we should take a lunch break. Okay, half hour for lunch, everybody. Your call's for 5 tomorrow morning, LeVar. 5? Yeah, sorry. So get your sleep. 5 a.m. Right. Sherman. Thanks, Thanks. Schedule. What? We're what? On this scene, buddy. We're, look, we're really depending on you. Right. You gotta get those lines No, I got them, Sherman. It's okay. No, okay, I got them. Speaking em. of lines, what? excuse me. What? You're not listening what? to me, LeVar. I'm listening to you, Ronnie. Here's some last-minute script changes. Script changes. Please learn it by today. This afternoon, Here's right? Here's your liver, LeVar. Sorry, it's um, a little cold. Liver? Yes, liver and onions on wet with ketchup. Isn't that what you ordered? Not exactly. Boy, showbiz. Sometimes it's not all it's cracked up to be. They put words in our mouths, costumes on our backs, and then turn us into anything they dream up. Like that. Uh-uh-uh, I'm sorry, LeVar. This is a prop. I need it for tomorrow. Here, LeVar, why don't you take a look at this book? It's for our next show. I'm tired. I think I need a vacation. B and Mr. Jones. Hmm. I've had it with kindergarten, B. Jones said to her father as he was sitting down to breakfast. Do you think I like my job? I'm tired of running for the 745 train. <laughs> Boy, sounds like this book is especially for me. Mr. Jones. Story and pictures by Amy Schwartz. I've had it with kindergarten, B. Jones said to her father as he was sitting down to breakfast. I've had it with beanbag games. I've had it with clothespin games. I've had it with sitting on that dumb green rug and playing that dumb colored lollipop game. I'm ready for a change. Mr. Jones put down his muffin and coffee. Beatrice, he said, do you think I like my job? I'm tired of running for the 745 train. I'm tired of sitting at that desk and working so hard. I'm tired of laughing at the boss's jokes all day. Doesn't sound so bad to me, said B. Mr. Jones looked thoughtfully at his daughter. Beatrice, he said, what if we trade places today? B smiled. At 
Actually, she said, that makes perfect sense to me. And so, after breakfast, Bee put on her father's coat and tie. She looked very important. Mr. Jones put on his sneakers and turned cartwheels for a while. He felt better immediately. <laughs> He caught the 745 train with time to spare. She slid onto the empty seat next to her father's business associate and best friend, Harvey Hopkins. Morning, Harvey, she said, and then explained that she would be taking her father's place today. Well, said Harvey, today is going to be dreadful. This afternoon is the deadline for the Crumbly Crackers campaign, and we haven't come up with a thing. B patted Harvey's hand reassuringly as the train pulled out of the station. The train reached the city and B and Harvey hurried to the Smith building. They took the elevator to the 42nd floor and walked into Smith and Smith advertising. Harvey sent around a memo which read, Attention all executives, please note that Mr. Jones will not be with us today. He is at kindergarten. B. Jones will be taking his place. And B. introduced herself all around. Meanwhile, Mr. Jones had also arrived safely and soundly at Miss Seymour's kindergarten class. He figured the tallest person in the class was Miss Seymour and handed her a note which read, Dear Miss Seymour, please excuse Beatrice from class today. She is tired of being a kindergartner. Mr. Jones is taking her place. Sincerely, Mr. Jones. Well, Miss Seymour sputtered, I must say this is rather unusual, but since I do have a note from the child's father, and she looked over her glasses at Mr. Jones, I suppose it must be all right with me. Well, Mr. Jones loved being in kindergarten. He was a whiz at the colored lollipop game. Vermilion red, I believe. Miss Seymour told him he was almost as bright as Jimmy Davis, the class genius. At snack time, Mr. Jones was chosen as milk and cookie monitor, and he didn't spill a thing. At recess, he helped Miss Seymour get Jimmy Davis down from the magnolia tree. Miss Seymour told Mr. Jones that he was a big help. In fact, Mr. Jones was rapidly becoming the teacher's pet. Oh, Mr. Jones, Miss Seymour sighed, you're wonderful. Back at Smith & Smith, B was fitting in just fine, too. The first thing she did was give her secretary the day off. Then she sharpened all her pencils and drew a nice picture on her blotter. She was very busy. At the board meeting, B laughed harder than anyone at the boss's jokes. She thought they were great. To get to the other side, B chuckled. <laughs> That's wonderful. Best of all, B came up with a wonderful new jingle for Crumbly Crackers just in time to save the account. Gentlemen, listen to this. Munchy crunchy, my dear snackers, you will love our Crumbly Crackers. Astounding. A genius. That afternoon, B was offered a promotion. When Mr. Jones came to pick B up at the train station, they were both very tired but very happy. I feel more relaxed than I have in 20 years, said Mr. Jones. I love advertising. What a challenge, said B. So the next day, Mr. Jones went to kindergarten and B went to the office once again. Goodbye, Father. And the next day. And the next. And the next. <laughs> At work, B was made president of toy sales. 
And at kindergarten, Mr. Jones continued to astound Miss Seymour and his classmates with his extraordinary <laughs> intelligence. Excellent! Mr. Jones and Beans have each found their proper niche in the world. So, remember that big kid you saw getting in for half price at the movie matinee and you just couldn't believe he was under 12? Well, you were probably right. And remember that very short executive that you saw having lunch with your father last Thursday? Well, perhaps you know who that was, too. <laughs> I think I saw a little tiny executive just the other day. I wonder if that could be Miss Jones. You know, there's nothing like the right costume to make me feel like a new person. Aha, yes. Yes, I'm feeling better already. Ah, yes, indeed. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me there, madam. Could you please curb your dog? You know, I love switching roles to find out how somebody else lives, but just for a little while. Excuse me, mister, I'm lost. My mommy said if ever I get lost, you ask a policeman. A policeman? Of course. Well, well, where do you live, little girl? Number 11 Charles Street. Number 11 Charles Street? Well, that's just right around the corner. You're not lost. You're almost there. Thank you, mister. You're welcome. You know, it's nice helping people. I think I'll, I'll try being king for a while. I've always wanted to be a king. Ah, here's a crown. And no king is complete without his royal regal cape. Ah, yes. And a scepter. <clears throat> here, here. If you could be somebody, anybody else in the world, who would you choose? Speak up now, speak up. You mustn't keep his majesty waiting. I like to be a millionaire. Hmm, a singer because I like to sing. I'd like to be a photographer. I, I like to work in a bank. A surgical doctor. I want to be a teacher. A policeman. Well, I've always wanted to be a movie actress. A football player. An artist because I love to paint. An astronaut. A princess. A lawyer, because my cousin Cindy's a lawyer, and I like her, and I like the way her office is, and lawyers make a lot of money. When I used to dream of being an actor, there were always certain roles that I wanted to play. Welcome to Transylvania. I always knew Count Dracula was my type. My blood type. <laughs> Every actor dreams of playing Shakespeare. And one of the best and certainly most romantic parts in all of Shakespeare's plays is that of Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. But soft, what light from yonder window breaks. Tis the east, and Juliet is the sun. Sometimes an actor is so good at playing a role, he becomes identified with the character he creates. Such is the case with the great actor Basil Rathbone in his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. Aha! Look here, Dr. Watson. Any amateur could deduce that you did it. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out of there. When you daydream, you can become anything or anybody. And it was certainly a dream come true for me when I had the chance to portray Ron LaFleur, one of my baseball heroes, in a TV movie called One in a Million, The Ron LaFleur Story. Here's a book that's all about daydreaming. Daydreamers. Poem by Eloise Greenfield. Pictures by Tom Felix. Daydreamers, holding their bodies still for a time, letting the world turn around them, while their dreams hopscotch, double dutch, dance, thoughts 
Roller skate, crisscross, bump into hopes and wishes. Dreamers, thinking up new ways, looking toward new days, planning new tries, asking new whys. Before long, hands will start to move again. Eyes turn outward, bodies shift for action. Before this moment, they are still. They are the daydreamers, letting the world dizzy itself without them. Scenes passing through their minds make no sound, glide from hiding places, promenade, and return silently. The children watch their memories with spirit eyes, seeing more than they saw before, feeling more, or maybe less, than they felt the time before, reaching with spirit hands to touch the dreams drawn from their yesterdays. They will not be the same after this growing time, this dreaming. In their stillness, they have moved forward toward womanhood, toward manhood. This dreaming has made them new. Twelve-year-old Jason Hardman is a boy who turned his daydreams into reality. He wanted a library for his hometown of Elsinore, Utah, and he worked hard till he got one. Now he's the youngest librarian in the United States, and one of the youngest people ever to testify before a congressional subcommittee. I'm Jason Hardman, and I run the Elsinore Library in Elsinore. It's an isolated community. 700 people is all that lives here. The community of Elsinore had to get have a library, so I decided to open it. I feel real proud over it because I've done something like this for the um, community of Elsinore. This is my computer, and you caught me right in the middle of cataloging books. As you can see, I have about a ton of books I got to catalog, and it's going to be quite a task. The reason I probably have this computer is because computers are an essential in the library. They can answer most of your questions, and it's a lot easier than having a card file. I've probably got close to 10,000 books in my library, 4,000 here, and about 6,000 in my library. When I look at all my books, it's quite overwhelming because 4,000 4, books is a lot of books to have in your living room, and it's just about filled the whole complete living room. I have all kinds of books. They range from children's books to adult um, fiction to paperbacks. But my favorites are the old ones. Um, I have an old one here by Jack London. It's uh, 1900. It's real old. It's quite nice. And I have Little Women by Louisa M. Alcott. It's a quite nice book. It's from 1863. But I, I really do like the old classics. Jason? It's 3.45. I think you better get ready to go to the library, hen. Okay. Hey, it's time to open up. Want to come along? I'll show you around. Before I started the library, I had to pedal to Monroe to get my books, which is six miles away. And since I started in Elsinore, I only have to pedal two to get there. And it's quite a lot easier than pedaling six. My the story started about two years ago when I started bugging the mayor for a library or for a room. The town council finally gave me a library. It's in the basement of the old White Rock schoolhouse about in the center of town. It was a place to start. I wasn't going to complain. And this is my library. And over here, I have all my fiction. I have my paperbacks up on the top. I have fiction here, and I have paperbacks up here. Over here, I have fiction, and I have paperbacks. Right here, I have my history and history, and I have three sets of encyclopedias. 
and right here I have all my religion and over here I have all my classics um, Tom Sawyer Tale of Two Cities and Treasure Island and right here I have my children's books and I have my children's books over here when I see people from the community come in here I, I feel real great because they are taking advantage of the library and when I first started out I barely got anybody so it's quite nice to have about 10 people a week come down here it's important for the people to return the books they borrowed because other people might want to read the books that they have so it is very important for me to keep track of old books and as the town librarian I have to give a report to the town council every month in my report I tell them my needs and how my library is doing. Hello. Hello, Jason. Uh, sit down, please. Uh, Jason uh, has been asked to come in here at this time in our uh, meeting and uh, make his monthly report on the conditions of the library and the progress we're making there. Uh, my report is on a new library because the library I'm in right now is not the best. It's very damp and the moisture comes up and it'll eventually ruin the books in years to come. And plus I have a computer I have to secure down there and the place is not very secure. Anybody can go in and out of it. And I would like a new building so I could secure my computer. Uh, what type of building were you considering, Jason? Uh, what kind of construction? How large a building do you need? Uh, we need to know these things. Um, it have to be pretty big since I do have quite a lot of books. When I first went to the town council, I was pretty scared because I've never I've never met him before or anything. Now when I go in, I'm not scared at all because I've been facing adults in my library. So I'm not scared when I go in at all. You know, it only takes one book to start a library. I started mine with one book and I have over 10,000 right now because I went door to door collecting these books. Well, it just goes to show that if you don't give up on a dream, your dream will eventually come true. Sometimes Jason's customers ask him for books that aren't on the shelves because somebody got there first. Well, if you like being Mr. Jones, and it's not there when you are because somebody beat you to it, here are some other books you might want to check out. But you don't have to take my word for it. Hello, boys and girls. I am Yolanda. I read a great book called There's a Nightmare in My Closet. It was about a little boy. That nightmare lived in his closet. And before he goes to bed, he'll close the closet door and he'll take his gun and he'll take his army hat to protect him. One night, the nightmare came out of the closet. That nightmare was even more scared than the little boy was. So the little boy took the nightmare to bed with him. And then he says, I suppose there's another nightmare in my closet, but my bed's not big enough for three. I like this book a lot because it really helps me. And if you read it, you'll feel the same way. Hi, have you ever been fooled by the way something looks but found out that you were wrong? The Ugly Duckling by Hans Christian Andersen is exactly about that sort of thing. This fairy tale is about a duckling who is ugly. Because he's ugly, all the animals make fun of him. At the end of the book, he finds out that he's the most beautiful creature in the world, a swan. My name is V.J. Kartha, and I think that this book is great. It might teach you a thing or two, which is, never judge something by its appearance, in other words, never judge a book by its cover. Hello, Americans. This is Tom Puckett. And I think it's just plain old baloney when people say that men are not supposed to dance. And the book Max by Rachel Isadora proves it. And it's about a boy that finds a new way to warm up for a baseball game. He goes to dancing class. When he gets to the park, he's late for the game. But then it was his turn to bet. On the old two pitch, he had a home run and he leaped to all the bases. I'm a hockey fan, and I think it's terrific that Max learned to dance. Take it from me, sports fans. This is a dandy book. 
and you can find it at your own library. Well, I think if we can get through this page okay, in the next half hour, we'll probably get the whole minutes. thing today. Oh, Cecily, have you seen LeVar? No, I thought he was with you. Uh, no, but we need him in five minutes. Okay. Ron, what? have you seen LeVar? Uh, no, I gave him script changes, and I thought he was with you. Okay, if you see him, tell him we're ready to roll in five, okay? Sure. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I was just looking for LeVar Burton, our host. Have you seen him? LeVar Burton? No, I never heard of the guy. Oh, my God. thank you very much. You're very welcome, and have a nice day. LeVar! You see, daydreaming can be a terrific way of taking a vacation in your mind without really going anywhere. You can take a trip into the past or into the future to decide where you might want to be someday. But as for me, I just like coming home, back to reality. I'm an actor, not a pirate or a detective or a king. But that's why I love what I do. I get the chance to be, well, almost anybody. And if I can convince you that a character is real for just a moment, then that's part of my pay. LeVar, here you are. We're ready to roll. Well, so am I. We'll see you next time. Okay, everybody, here we go. Last time around. <coughs> Stand by. Okay, let's have quiet on the set, please. Quiet on the set. Okay, and roll tape. Stand by and slate. Here we go. Scene one, take 60. Okay, action. It's no secret that Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers or that Susie sold seashells by the seashore. Well, today on Reading Rainbow, we're going to show you some new tongue twisters. See if you can say rubber baby buggy bumpers five times fast without making a mistake. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a Reading Rainbow. to grow a reading rainbow I can be anything take a look it's in a book a reading rainbow I can go anywhere friends to know and ways to grow a reading rainbow A reading rainbow. Funding for Reading Rainbow is made possible by a grant from Kellogg's, who urges you to explore the joys of reading. Funding for the series was also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>